Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13497 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak to the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Jamie Hepburn, Minister, to move the motion. Minister. Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. In fact, no member has asked to speak to the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 13497 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Bankruptcy and Diligence Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at stage two, that is SP Bill 27A the Marshall list and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for around five minutes for the first division of the stage three. The period of voting for the first division will be 45 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons or enter letters RTS in the chat function as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. And we turn to Group 1, Mental Health Moratorium. I call Amendment 15 in the name of Paul O'Kane, grouped with Amendments 1, 23, 2 and 3. I call on Paul O'Kane to move Amendment 15 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Mr O'Kane. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I uh, rise to move Amendment 15 in my name, and in doing so uh, would point out to the Chamber that this is a, a rather simple amendment in, in my view, and is intended to give greater permanency and certainty around the creation of the mental health uh, moratorium. At uh, stage two, I brought amendments that would uh, put the moratorium and some of its provisions onto the face of the bill. And the driving force behind that and behind uh, all of my amendments in this regard has been concerns from stakeholders that there has not been particular certainty around the nature of the moratorium or its uh, creation. And I thought that at stage two, we had a good discussion on uh, the a potential detail of the moratorium, and I did accept the arguments that the Minister at the time, Tom Arthur, made around the desire to keep the moratorium in regulations, meaning uh, changes and improvements could be made over time uh, as their impact is reviewed. So I understand uh, all of those arguments. Um, so that is why, uh, having reflected on um, indeed the government's response of publishing those uh, regulations for people to be able to interact with them and see what is being proposed, I have brought back this simpler amendment at stage two for the purposes of ensuring more certainty certainty uh, around the moratorium. Uh, obviously, um, we want to uh, have certainty that a mental health moratorium will exist, and I, I don't doubt the Scottish Government's intent or desire. Indeed, and uh, as I've said, there have been uh, num numerous uh, productive discussions in this regard. But I do think it's important that we set that out uh, on the face of the legislation. Um, because whilst we all agree in principle, um, I think it is necessary for those who are struggling to be able to see the intent of this Parliament in terms of uh, what we will do in regulation uh, to support them. Um, the other purpose of the amendment um, has been, I suppose, uh, somewhat probing in order to ensure that we can have a debate today about the nature of the moratorium, so the Minister can perhaps say more about the details that he has published in, uh, to consult on, uh, and so that we can uh, ha hear a number of views on, on what it should be in scope or not for the wider moratorium as well. Uh, indeed, I think there have been lots of discussions about uh, who qualifies for the moratorium and what sorts of treatments would qualify, and indeed what sort of mental health professionals can attest to um, the, the need for that support uh, through a moratorium. So it's, I think it's important that we continue to have these debates, Deputy Presiding Officer. Just briefly, in terms of other amendments in this group, uh, uh, supporting obviously Amendment 15 in the name of my colleague Daniel Johnson, which would ensure that ministers can only make regulations within the scope of the long title of the bill, maintaining a place for uh, Parliament and this Chamber in any further work. Uh, I also uh, note and welcome the Minister's uh, amendments to strengthen commitments to reviewing and enhancing scrutiny procedures in terms of regulations. I think that that is important for scrutiny and getting amendments right. And I do look forward to um, a further debate this afternoon and the Minister laying out detail of his amendments and indeed any further draft regulations that will be laid before this Parliament uh, and indeed consulted upon. Um, so I am very grateful, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer.
Mr King, could you please move your Amendment 15? Uh, formally moved. Thank you. I now call the Minister Ivan McKee to speak to Amendment 1 and other amendments in the group. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. President Officer, Amendment 15 seeks to impose a duty on the Scottish Ministers to make regulations establishing a mental health moratorium in Scotland. The Scottish Government has already committed to preparing these regulations and has shared a version of these draft regulations with Parliament. I therefore do not believe it is necessary through this bill to impose a duty upon Scottish Ministers to make regulations. The bill's approach of saying Ministers may make regulations is common, and this aspect of the bill attracted no comment from the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, whose business it clearly would be. There is also the technical question as to whether it is within Scottish Government's gift to make these regulations. These regulations would be subject to the affirmative procedure, and Ministers cannot be compelled to make the regulations if Parliament does not actively approve them. As a legal requirement in the bill, what sanctions would be envisaged if Ministers failed to make the regulations? With what time scale would they have to comply? It may be that the intention of this amendment was to require Scottish ministers to lay regulations for parliamentary approval, but we do not think that is what the drafting actually achieves. And as a copy of the draft regulations have already been shared with Parliament, there should be no doubt that we intend on laying regulations for the mental health moratorium if this bill is passed. Ministers do not need to be under a statutory duty to do so. Amendment 23 seeks to restrict the legislation which may be modified by the mental health moratorium regulations. Daniel Johnson may be seeking to introduce some certainty around this aspect of the power in section 1, but we should be very careful before departing from what is standard provision. There may be some unintended consequences in doing so, and it may be unnecessarily restrict the ability of the mental health moratorium regulations to give full effect to the policy developed alongside stakeholders. To take an example, the amendment says we can only amend the bankruptcy Act, but in developing the proposals, we may all agree that other legislation relating to protections against evictions, for example, needs to be adjusted. This would not uh, be in the Bankruptcy Act, and therefore this amendment would prevent that. Bear in mind that, as drafted, the Bill does not allow the mental health moratorium regulations to simply amend any legislation. The modification of any enactment would be limited by the scope of the original power under Section 1.1 of the Bill. The Bill therefore allows the mental health moratorium regulations to modify the provision in any enactment, but only insofar as the modification relates to the operation of the mental health moratorium. Making a, moratorium to, a modification sorry, to an existing enactment may simply be the best way to achieve the required change in terms of ensuring legal accessibility. The Bill as drafted provides more certainty than Amendment 23, which refers to the Bankruptcy Act, but also to the law of diligence, the limits of which would not be certain. I would therefore ask Paul O'Kane and Daniel Johnson not to press amendments 15 and 23, but if pressed to a vote, I would ask that members reject those amendments. Turning to the Government's amendments, Amendment 1 is required to allow the mental health moratorium regulations to make provision for how the mental health moratorium will interact with a standard moratorium. The Scottish Government has proposed in our public consultation for the mental health moratorium regulations that an individual would not be able to apply for a standard moratorium under Part 15 of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016 within six months of having exited a mental health moratorium. 73 per cent of respondents to that consultation agreed with that approach. Some may disagree with the timescale proposed, which we can consider further. However, regardless of the timescale agreed, it will be necessary for the mental health moratorium regulations to include provision about how the mental health moratorium interacts with the standard moratorium under the 2016 Act. Amendment 1 therefore adds a further example of things which the regulations may cover and makes it clear that the regulations may make a provision in respect of any post-mental health moratorium period. Moving to Amendments 2 and 3, the Scottish Government acknowledges the views expressed during Stage 1 and Stage 2 debates regarding the need to afford Parliament sufficient opportunity to scrutinise the details of the regulation establishing the mental health moratorium. During the Stage 2 committee session, my predecessor acknowledged the intention of an amendment on this topic from Daniel Johnson, and while that particular amendment was withdrawn, we undertook to look further into what action could be taken to provide Parliament with more comfort as to the process for establishing the mental health moratorium. It is with that in mind that I have lodged Amendment 2. This amendment is similar in tension to Mr Johnson's Stage 2 amendment. It will allow Parliament further scrutiny of a copy of the first set of mental health re moratorium regulations for a period of 60 days prior to the regulations being formally laid. 
It will also require the Scottish Government to report on any representations made by Parliament on those regulations and what changes have been made to the regulations as a result of the representations received when the regulations are laid. In keeping with the scrutiny of the Mental Health Moratorium regulations, Amendment 3 requires Scottish Ministers to undertake a review of those regulations as soon as reasonably practical, five years after the regulations which establish a moratorium have come into force. I am committed to ensuring the Mental Health Moratorium achieves its goal to help those with severe mental health issues and problem debt. While I am, of course, ambitious and hope that the regulations will achieve that goal first time round, I entirely accept that the matter will need to be kept under review to see what elements of the scheme could be refined or improved. I therefore believe it will be necessary to formally review the impact of the Mental Health Moratorium after a reasonable period of time has elapsed. This amendment will put that commitment on a statutory footing. In conclusion, President Officer, I would urge members to support my amendments 1, 2 and 3 and to reject amendments 15 and 23. And I formally move amendments 1, 2 and 3. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I call Daniel Johnson to speak to amendment 23 and other amendments in the group. Mr Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Look, can I begin by thanking the Government for bringing forward the amendments that, that were just outlined uh, by the Minister that, that cover off broadly the same area in terms of clarifying the, the, the process. I think that does uh, improve the bill uh, uh, and it does improve the clarity of the process. And, and I thank them uh, for doing so. So, but I think also in terms of uh, what we've just heard from the Minister, it outlines some of the, the issues that I think are still with this bill, because it's a framework bill. This is inherently a complex and technical area of law, one that is very important, uh, but one where actually the precise mechanisms uh, that, that will be implemented aren't clear because they'll be brought forward by regulation. Now, I think it's, uh, 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 of course, positive that the government have brought forward draft regulations, but it was only just last week that the Economy Committee were able to look at those. So the amendments that we brought forward in this group actually go to this point about the nature of framework bills and their, their both efficacy, but also the, uh, uh, how well they address what are fundamentally technical points of law. So Paul O'Kane's amendment is about actually ensuring that those things that are features set out the bill are brought forward as a matter of regulation. So we have clarity about what the features of this legislation will do. Because without it, frankly, we just have an indication rather than a guarantee of those features. And likewise with mine, and, and I listened uh, uh, closely to what the Minister said, but the reality is if you look at subsection 3 of section 1, it states this, that regulations under this section may... Uh, be, make different provisions for different purposes and modify any enactment. Now, I am not a lawyer, and I will happily defer to those that are. And I see Myrtle Fraser smiling as I say that. But I don't see in that wording that that does restrict ministers in the way that the minister just set out. It does seem to me that if you can make regulations for different provisions, for different purposes, and altering any act, that is an incredibly broad scope of regulating making powers. Now, there are, of course, uh, 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 circumstances where regulating making powers are, are a much more sensible approach, particularly when you're talking about uh, percentages or levies or, or, or numerical amounts that may need to change because of circumstances. But at the other end of the spectrum, we have very broadly stated provisions where we cannot scrutinise the, 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 the legislation. And what I am merely seeking to do is that under this Act, the ministers can bring forward uh, 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 regulations that seek to deal with the purposes are set out within this Act. I don't think that's unreasonable. I'm happy to be persuaded otherwise that my reading of the law is not accurate. But otherwise, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask that uh, regulation-making powers are limited to the purposes and functions as set out within an Act uh, of Parliament. And that is simply why I'm offering uh, my amendment in this section. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Johnson. And I call on Paul O'Kane to wind up and to press withdraw Amendment 15. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I don't think I have too much uh, more to add. I think there was a very eloquent argument across uh, all of these amendments by uh, Daniel Johnson, but in particular my amendment. Um, I, I think what he seeks to do today is ensure that um, the consensus that is around the mental health moratorium is stated uh, in law and on the face of the bill and compels ministers, indeed, to bring forward those regulations uh, to Parliament for, for consideration. Because I think, as we have spoken to stakeholders across the 
uh, progression of this bill, and indeed at stage two, it was very clear uh, the need for this moratorium uh, and the desire to see that move forward as quickly as possible. I thought Daniel Johnson did make a number of important points uh, to the Minister indeed around um, the nature of framework bills, uh, and I suppose the challenge is very often in being able to properly scrutinise them and the detail of them, and indeed I think the point he made about um, the committee's scrutiny of the draft regulations being a, a tight window, I think, was well made as well. I, and I think it's clear that across this bill, uh, as a framework bill, we would want to see the opportunity to be able um, to um, compel the government, but also to give the government the opportunity to bring forward um, further regulations that will uh, enhance the bill and move it forward. And I do know, as Daniel Johnson also said, some of the work the Minister has done in terms of his amendments in order to, um, to bring that forward. Uh, yes, I'll give away to Mark Whitfield. Whitfield. To pull it. My slight apologies for the way that this is, this is phrased, but with regard to the amendment that the Minister has brought as Amendment 3, can I first welcome, in essence, an, an example of post-legislative scrutiny where after five years there will be a review that will allow the opportunity to look at this again, and I think that, 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 that's a very positive thing to see. But I wonder whether um, my colleague is aware of, of what the likely date of those first regulations, when those first regulations are likely to be laid or brought forward, so those outside of this place have an understanding of when the five years will run to. Follow King. I thank Martin Whitfield for his intervention and for the point that he raises, um, which I think is a very important point and indeed uh, very relevant. And I think I said in my remarks the, the need for uh, certainty and for understanding uh, for those outside of this chamber about, um, as I say, the things that they would want to see in the bill that will enhance it and make sure that people are given the adequate protections must be done. So I think that's a very clear point and something I'm sure the government will want to reflect on more widely uh, in our proceedings today. So um, in conclusion, uh, Deputy President, officer. Um, I, I believe that this amendment is important. I believe that it will um, push the government to ensure that that moratorium is indeed enacted upon uh, and consulted on widely, and uh, I will press the amendment. Thank you, Mr Cain. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed and there will be a division. As this is the first division of the Stage 3, I suspend for around five minutes to allow members to access the digital voting system.